This example shows a 6 to 1 multiplexer with binary coded inputs. Notice that a default value has been defined for the remaining possible combinations of select line values. This makes the implementation much smaller. XST used not only LUTs for this design's construction, but also took advantage of the dedicated MUXs included with each slice. These MUXs allow larger multiplexers to run faster and save LUTs. In this case, the result used fewer LUTs and got better performance by having the dedicated MUXs available. This design also inferred a register on the data out signal. This effectively added a pipeline stage. Recall that this is one of the best ways to improve system performance in an FPGA. If this did not have a registered output, a critical path could evolve through this MUX. It's usually best to always try to build the outputs of the lower leaf level boundaries with an output register. Now we have rebuilt this component, but with the select lines one hot encoded, so you can get an idea what we're talking about. Now this MUX used more LUTs than the binary encoded version, but had a shorter timing critical path. This is typical using one hot encoding techniques. However, if this MUX were much larger, it would have been much faster than the binary encoded version, but would have also been much larger than the binary encoded version. That is, it would use more LUTs. That is because there are now 12 inputs to decode, not 9 inputs, as in the previous example. Some other basic performance tips include avoiding high-level constructs like for loops. Sometimes synthesis tools don't produce the most efficient result, so be sure and test these components with your synthesis tool. Another commonly known coding style is to group arithmetic and logical operators, such as we see here. This guides the synthesis tool to map B and C to one LUT and map D and E to another LUT. This is the most efficient mapping. Recall that the carry logic resource will program each LUT to do the addition of two bits plus the carry input. This is also important for logical functions. Finally, use synchronous resets whenever possible. Not only is this good for circuit reliability in all FPGAs, but it enables efficient mapping to the FPGA architecture. Synchronous design works best for numerous reasons, most of which we explain in more detail in a later module, specifically the synchronous design module as part of the essentials course. The most significant reason is that your design can fail if it maps to a different speed grade, device family, or product. This leads to a great deal of insecurity about the reliability of the design. It also wastes time, not just timing, but your productivity when you try to debug a design at a much later date. Synchronous designs have as few clocks as possible, use synchronous resets, and have no gated clocks. Now, if a customer insists on having an asynchronous reset, I usually tell them that their circuit should behave okay as long as the reset is global, but I never allow a local asynchronous reset in the design. For more information on synchronous design practices, check out the synchronous design modules I mentioned in the Essentials of FPG Design course. As I mentioned a moment ago, using synchronous sets and resets is one of the elements of proper synchronous design. In these examples, you can see that we have inferred D flip-flops with synchronous and asynchronous sets and resets. It is important to remember that for a control signal to be synchronous, it must be contained within the always block and not be listed in the sensitivity list. So example one is just a simple D flip-flop. Example two now has an asynchronous preset inferred. This is accomplished by placing the preset in the sensitivity list. Example three has a D flip-flop with an asynchronous reset for the same reason as example two. The reset has been placed in the sensitivity list, so the flip-flop must have the behavior that if the reset is asserted, it will reset regardless of the rising edge of the clock. Now, example four shows a proper register inference. The flip-flop has a synchronous reset by not including the reset signal in the sensitivity list. In other words, the reset is only checked when the rising edge of the clock has been detected. In examples two and three, the asynchronous control signal can be asserted regardless of the rising edge of the clock, and that's not good. Clock enables are used in synchronous design as well. They should always be used instead of gating a clock. 
Now, as you know, gating a clock signal and then driving it to a clock port on a flip-flop can glitch in any FPGA. To synchronize the clock, just drive the derived clock signal to the clock enable port. In these examples, we see the enable is a simple one-bit signal, but it could be whatever derived signal you want it to be. The key is that the enable check is a nested if-then statement, usually right after the clock signal check. For clarification, we mentioned earlier that nested if-then statements are not recommended. That was only in the case of building purely common through logic. In this case, it is a register process that is not inferring common through logic. You should also note that if you infer an asynchronous reset or preset or even gate o'clock signal in your design, your synthesis tool will not send a warning or error message. It is left up to you to avoid making a big mistake. Now let's wrap up this module with a summary. First of all, use as much of the dedicated hardware resources as possible to ensure optimum speed and device utilization. And what we're talking about here is try to target as much of the dedicated hardware so it will save you using lookup tables and registers in your standard array logic. Plan on instantiating clocking and memory resources. As we mentioned, these are very frequently, very commonly instantiated by most customers. It is possible to infer the primary functionality for the rote, simple implementations of the clocking and the memory resources. But again, the, the architecture wizard and core generator are there for that purpose, to allow you to instantiate those components easily. Try to use the core generator not only for the clocking and the memory resources, but also other dedicated FPGA features like the DSP slice and the FIFO logic resources. Also, maintain your design hierarchy to main, make debugging, simulation, and report generation easier. Continue on with the summary. Case and if-then statements produce different types of MUXs. As we described, case statements tend to build logic in parallel, while if-then statements tend to build priority encoders. The priority encoders tend to often make timing-critical paths later on in a design. So in general, build with a case statement if you can. Avoid nested case and nested if-then statements. Again, for the same reason. It tends to build logic in series rather than in parallel, and it tends to slow the performance down. You should always build a synchronous design for your FPGA, not just for speed, but the key thing here is to save you time and make your design more productive. And we mentioned a couple key tips about following good synchronous design practices. Build with your clock enable and use synchronous sets and resets whenever possible. Never build asynchronous sets or resets. Lastly, inferring many types of flip-flops from your HDL code is possible. And as we mentioned, those synchronous sets and resets are preferred. There are some very useful resources available to you on support.zonix.com. The Synthesis and Simulation Design Guide discusses some of these same topics. The XST User Guide is very helpful for example inferences of architectural resources. This is often what is most helpful to customers, so I would strongly encourage you to check out the XST User Guide. Note that all the coding techniques we've shown you here apply to XST. These are the same coding techniques often apply to other synthesis vendors. But if you want coding styles and attributes for another vendor's synthesis tool, you'll have to go to their website to learn more. If you would like to see what other courses we offer or what other free REL's are available, go to the Xilinx Education link you see here. I would also like to mention again that there are architecture modules available that discuss the basics of Xilinx's newest devices, and these are offered in an REL format. You may find this useful, especially if you want to learn more about the device differences. And again, my name is Frank Nelson, and you've been listening to the Basic HDL Coding Techniques REL Part 1. Thanks for listening, and thank you for your business.